Hello and welcome to the Jack Rosen Memorial Award Pitch Competition. It's great to have so many of you here with us today. My name is Brock Dickinson. I'm going to be your MC tonight. Uh, I, I'm in this role because I'm the entrepreneur in residence with the Faculty of Environment, and that means I get to work with students on many of the issues that we're going to explore over the course of the evening. I get to work alongside student entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm a graduate of some of the, the programs of the faculty itself, uh, and I now lecture uh, in the faculty as well. And I think that one of the things that has become clear through all of that work is that we have amazing entrepreneurial talent, as you're all going to see over the course of this evening's event. I want to start by acknowledging that this event is uh, an activity of the University of Waterloo, and the Waterloo, Kitchener, and Cambridge campuses of the university are all located on the Haldeman Tract, which is land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River and is in the traditional territories of the Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our great standard of living is tied to the policies of expulsion, assimilation, and abuse of Indigenous people. We have a responsibility to acknowledge with respect and understanding the diverse histories and cultures of all Indigenous people of this country. And as we begin tonight's event, I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are residing on or that you are joining us from this evening. Thanks to everybody who has decided to, to make this a part of their evening. We have, we have students, we have staff, we have alumni, we have faculty, we have friends and family members of, of, of some of the folks that are, that are pitching this evening. It's great to have this entire community come together around this event. Uh, and for those of us who have been here before, we know what a great event it's going to be. For those of you who are here for the first time, you're in for a real treat. I particularly want to welcome, uh, as we open, members of the Rosen family who are here with us this evening. Uh, Shelley Rosen and Judy Rosen uh, are both in attendance this evening. We, we will hear from them a little later on. They are the daughters of Jack and Honey Rosen, who uh, are, are the inspiration for this particular event in terms of the amazing things that they did over the course of their lives to contribute to that connection between entrepreneurship and environment. Uh, but they also, I think, uh, have been real members of this community as we have sought to support and engage students uh, in promoting uh, new solutions to environmental challenges over time. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to have them both here with us this evening. We, we really appreciate their ongoing support of this project and this program, their ongoing support of the university, and this amazing opportunity to celebrate the legacy and history uh, of their family and their parents in particular. Uh, today's entrepreneurs, the, 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 the folks, the students that are pitching in today's competition are competing to win a grand prize of $3,000 uh, and an honorable mention sort of second place uh, uh, prize of $1,000 to help drive their ideas and their innovations to, to the next level. Uh, and we know this will be a tough process for our judges to figure out because we always have some outstanding pitches uh, and, and all of these teams have done amazing work in preparing for this evening. Uh, but we hope that all of you, regardless of whether you're one of the teams pitching or not, will be inspired by the showcase of unique ideas and unique approaches to environmental challenges that we'll explore tonight, uh, and that you'll all start to think about ways in which we can work uh, collaboratively towards uh, a better Canada and a better world as we think about the needs of future generations. I do want to take just a couple of minutes to introduce our judges for this evening. This is always a, a challenging set of responsibilities. Uh, the first of our judges tonight that I, that I want to acknowledge uh, is coming back for the second time uh, for this competition. This is Paul Netto, who is a proud alumnus of the Faculty of Environment and is currently the co-founder and chief marketing officer at Measure Protocol, a blockchain-powered marketplace for person-based data. Now, before uh, he started Measure Protocol, Paul was also the VP Digital and Media at Kantar Canada. He's been uh, a regular leader of digital innovation products and, and, and uh, research initiatives at various companies in the past, and a regular speaker at research and media conferences across North America. Paul, it's great to have you here with us again. You did an amazing job last year. We're, we're really glad that you, uh, you were willing to come back and spend some time with us again this year. Thank you. Thank you. Our second judge, uh, also returning for the second time this year, is Dr. Georgina O'Farrell. Uh, born and raised in Mexico City, uh, Georgina holds a PhD in Ecology and Conservation from McGill University, and she has more than 10 years experience coordinating and managing international projects and programs uh, focused on the belief that cooperation is the key to finding solutions to environmental challenges. 
Georgina is currently the Outreach and Partnerships Officer for the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, a partnership between the three North American governments of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And through her efforts there, she seeks to foster collaborations and partnerships to strengthen tri-national work on environmental issues. Georgina, it's great to have you with us again this year. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this. And joining us for the first time this year, it's my real pleasure to introduce Brad Liskey, our third and final judge. Uh, Brad is the CEO and co-founder of True Earth, an eco-friendly household product company uh, committed to eliminating plastic waste from landfills and oceans. Uh, True Earth is based in Port Moody, British Columbia, uh, and Brad believes that uh, the best thing we can do to save the planet is to educate and support young people as they seek to make a difference. He lives out this passion himself as a mentor in entrepreneurship at the University of British Columbia, where his uh, support often focuses on climate solutions. Brad was recently named one of the 16 top sustainability leaders by Canada's Clean 50 for 2022. So thank you, Brad, for joining us. Uh, I know this is your first go round. You've got a ton of experience with this kind of thing. So we're really appreciative of the fact that, uh, that you're here to be a part of the Jack Rosen uh, competition this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank Brad, just to, as, as we sort of begin to move into the more formal parts of the program, that in addition to the ongoing support from the Rosen family for, for this event, uh, True Earth and Brad have uh, made a, a generous uh, additional one-time donation for this year's Jack Rosen pitch competition of another $2,000. Uh, and we appreciate that very much. It, it goes a long way in supporting students as they, as they make uh, the, the, these, these ideas that they'll talk about this evening uh, a reality. And so thank you for, for the ongoing sort of support that you have provided as part of this particular event. I want to, um, uh, again, before we kind of move into the formal portion of things, just pause for a moment uh, and, and reflect a little bit on, on the origins of this competition, which go back to the truly inspirational uh, sort of work of, of Jack Rosen uh, in setting a standard for this notion of incorporating environmental concerns uh, and business solutions. And to help us kind of understand the contribution uh, that Jack Rosen made I want, to, I want us all to, to watch a, a brief video that talks about the history of his work and how it relates to this competition. Jack Rosen was born in Odessa, Russia in 1927 and is the third of five children to parents Israel and Razel Rosen. The family immigrated to Canada a few weeks after his birth. From a very early age, Jack would help his parents in the scrapyard. At 15, he began working in the family business I. Rosen & Sons, a secondary materials company that grew to become one of Ontario's premier recycling companies. Jack was always interested in drafting, and had he not joined the family business, he might have become an architect. He enjoyed designing buildings and always had a drafting table in his office. Jack met his wife, Honey Rosen, during the time she was working as a secretary at her father's scrap metal business in Toronto. Jack and Honey got married in 1949 in Hamilton. The couple were happily married for 57 years and had three children, Judy, Shelley, and the late Alan Rosen. One of Jack's many accomplishments was his involvement in the creation and implementation of the world's first blue box curbside recycling program in Kitchener during the 1970s. Initially tested with a small pilot program of 100 homes in Kitchener, Jack sourced for 100 plastic boxes and the only color available was blue. Thus, the blue box program gained its name. Jack and his colleagues were able to campaign the program by going into schools and educating students on the impact their actions can have on their surroundings. In turn, the students influenced their parents to become more environmentally conscious. Jack had a vision for the future and used his connections in the scrap metal and glass industries to advocate for sustainable living. By thinking outside the box, he convinced industrial companies of the value of using recyclable material to create their products. In the 1980s, the program's success reached an Ontario-wide effect, with Jack being responsible for the recycling of over 2.4 million tons of material. Presently, millions of homes around the world are served by Blue Box programs. Jack's passion for sustainability catalyzed change on the local, national, and international level. 
For this achievement and many others, he received the first Lifetime Achievement Award from the Recycling Council of Ontario. Through Honey Rosen's generosity and commitment to her husband's environmental legacy, the Jack Rosen Memorial Award for Environmental Innovation was established. The Jack Rosen Memorial Award for Environmental Innovation started as a poster competition and has now grown into the multifaceted program aimed at supporting aspiring student entrepreneurs through pitch resources, coaching and exposure. One of the most important things we achieved or accomplished through the Jack Rosen competition was the advice of all the coaches, the warm connections that they made. Since its inception in 2008, the Jack Rosen Memorial Award for Environmental Innovation has awarded over $35,000 and supported more than 50 student teams to change the world with their ideas. Today, Judy and Shelley Rosen continue to commemorate their late father by inspiring entrepreneurship. It is because of the Rosen family that we can continue to work together to support the next generation of leaders in hopes of bettering our communities and creating a more sustainable future just as Jack Rosen once did. I would like to especially thank the Rosen family. I would absolutely like to thank the Jack Rosen family for giving us this opportunity and, you know, giving us this first major win. I hope that gives you all a little bit of a sense of the uh... The, the, the history of behind this program and the amazing sort of experiences that have led us to where we are this evening. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Environment, Dean Jean Andrew, to come and say a few words on behalf of the faculty. Dean is known as, as a champion of these kinds of events and these kinds of initiatives and a real supporter of student entrepreneurs. So Jean, it's great to have you with us this evening and I'll, I'll turn things over to you. Well, thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here with you tonight. And uh... I'm really excited about, about uh, hearing about the pitch competitions. You know, we've been at this for about 15 years. And as the video said, you know, we've, we've, this, this competition has helped like 50 teams, but altogether there've been several hundred students who've competed and, you know, they learn and they grow just by, by virtue of being here. And, you know, the video also inspires me every time I see it because it reminds us that grassroots uh, um, starts to things, you know, um, really can grow and they can have a huge impact on the world just in the same way that Jack Rosen's visions for recycled uh, materials did. And um, the other thing I wanna say is, you know, entrepreneurship itself is so important. And all of you who are competing, you know that this is kind of going out your comfort zone in many ways. And entrepreneurs, I always say are about three C's. They're about, um, about curiosity, they're about courage, and they're about change. And that's what we're celebrating in our student competitors tonight. Now, it's not probably a surprise to you that the University of Waterloo would be hosting something like this with the amazing generosity of the Rosen family. And thank you, Shelley and Judy, for being here with us again. Um, but Waterloo has, has a long history of doing things in different ways. And you all know about the success of our co-op program, but people thought the university was absolutely crazy when it wanted to have alternating terms of work and study. And we, people also thought that as a Canadian university, it was a bit bizarre when we thought that entrepreneurship was such an important thing to invest in. But of course, Velocity then it became the largest free incubator in North America. So it's great to be at Waterloo and it's great that, uh, that all of you are, are here with us. Uh, before I pass off back to Brock, I just wanna acknowledge a few people. I wanna thank Tanya Delmato and St. Paul's for their continued partnership and support over the years. I know they, they help a great deal with our, our student entrepreneurs. And I also wanna acknowledge the support of our alumni who are an integral part of this. And also our, our three judges, Paul and Georgina and Brad. And of course, just one more thanks to the Rosen family. Thanks always for inspiring the next generation of green entrepreneurs. Back to you, Brock. Thank you, Jean. And uh, I want to turn now to uh, one more uh, short video. This is a thank you video that has been prepared um, by three of the teams uh, that, that uh, won portions of this competition last year. The teams were Decomp, uh, Procario, and Circular Harvest Farms. 
and I think uh, this will help us get a bit of an understanding on how much this, uh, this particular competition means to the student teams that participate. My experience while participating in the Jack Rosen pitch competition was exciting and intriguing, especially because it was one of the first pitch competitions that I took part in. Our team was provided with many helpful resources, including resources on how to build our pitch and coaching that enhanced our preparation for the competition. We were also introduced to a platform where we were able to connect with several different teams that had innovative ideas and solutions to current problems. Through participating and ultimately winning the pitch competition, we were able to gain a valuable support system, including having Brock Dickinson as our mentor and great exposure where we got recognition from several different teams from different establishments. We also received feedback from judges that helped target areas for further development that our team required and the winnings from the competition helped bring us closer to our funding goal. It's incredibly inspiring to hear about Jack Rosen's accomplishments, and I'd like to extend a huge thank you to the organizers of this event and to the Rosen family for their generosity. Good luck to all the finalists, and I can't wait to hear your innovative ideas. The Jack Rosen Award is an amazing experience, and it's a way that you can start to meet people that are like-minded. Me and my business partner, Kyle, we actually pitched separately our first year, but we realized we had the same idea. So the second year, we pitched together, and we formed this business that we started now called Circular Harvest. So we really have to thank the Rosen family for providing this award, because without it, we never would have met each other, and we would not have been able to win and start our business like we have. We had an absolutely wonderful evening with uh, everybody involved and it was just a wonderful event. We really felt uh, very much at home. It was a very friendly environment and it was the closest that we could get to feeling as if we were all there in person. We thank very much the family of Jack Rosen as well as everyone who made this possible including all the event planners and the hosts as well as the judges. Try to see also at the competition if you can make friends as we did and bounce ideas off of each other. These are wonderful places to mingle. So best of luck everybody on the 2022 competition. So Shelly and Judy, I know we say thank you a lot during, during this particular event, in, in part because we are so grateful, but I hope that also that quick video there just gives you a sense uh, of how transformative uh, your contributions are for, for the students that do take part in this. It's, it's great to see how these teams continue to thrive and grow a year, two years, five years after they've been through this sort of a competition. And so uh, thank you very much for your ongoing support. I have a couple of sort of housekeeping things I wanna do before we move into the sort of the formal portion of the pitch. I will ask that for teams that are not pitching or for members of the audience or various sort of panelists, if you can make sure that your cameras and microphones are off unless it's your turn to, to be front and center, that would be very helpful. It helps us kind of minimize the distractions and the background noises for, for the teams as they're going through the pitch. I, I will probably continue to remind folks of that as we go along, but that's one thing we really want to uh, emphasize so that we give everybody a kind of a fair, a fair shot with, without those sorts of distractions. Um, secondly, I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, we, we've got six teams that are pitching tonight. Um, this has been another strange year, right? We, we, we're, we're all tired of this COVID stuff. We're all ready for it to be over. It has not been easy for students to live and work through this process. It has certainly not been easy for teams of young entrepreneurs that are trying to work together and trying to explore these ideas to do that in an entirely virtual fashion. 
Uh, and so we do want to recognize the kind of the hard work, the effort, uh, the, the stress that has come along with some of the preparations for tonight. And, and although it, it's impossible for me to tell the six teams now to relax and enjoy this, to the best of your ability, relax and enjoy this because this is a great experience. And it's the first step on a much longer journey that I'm sure that many of you will be taking from here. So, you know, soak it in, uh, enjoy the, 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 uh, the activity, enjoy the questions, enjoy the ideas that are bouncing around. We're already proud of all six of these teams for what you've done just to get here this evening. Uh, and, and being a part of this stage of the competition is an accomplishment in and of itself. So I, I'm going to move now to the actual pitch portion of, of the evening. Uh, and the way that this has been set up is that each team has prepared a pre-recorded uh, video with a, a three minute time limit on it. Uh, and this will be followed by five minutes of live questions from our judges. Now that five minute timeline is a little bit longer than we have had in previous years. Um, I imagine that our judges will have lots of questions, so, so they may well fill that time. But I will say that if you're in the audience uh, and you have a question that pops to mind during one of these presentations, throw it into the chat uh, and uh, the judges may see it there. It might get added into their mix. If, we, if we've got a little extra time, I might bring it to the table. And certainly, even if we don't get to it during the, the, the short time that we have for questions, we'll share that with the team uh, after the event so that they'll be able to incorporate it into their thinking of, uh, of where they go in the future. So, so there is an opportunity for you to sort of share some questions and, and, and discussion points in the chat uh, as the pitches progress. So, uh, the judges, as I say, have a very difficult uh, task ahead of them. Uh, they will be evaluating these pitches on a number of criteria, including uh, innovativeness, effectiveness, simplicity, consumer appeal, and presentation skills. So with one more quick reminder uh, that we need to uh, turn our microphones and cameras off if we are not the pitching team, let me take a moment to introduce the first of those teams. Uh, the team is known as ESG, uh, Environmental Social Governance Advocate, ESG Advocate. Their project relates to an ESG tax. And presenting the pitch this evening is Dweep Lalprawala, who is a fourth year environment and business undergraduate student. So Dweep, when you are ready, we'll, uh, we'll tee things up here. Hey everyone, I'm Dweep. And today I would be presenting policy reform for ESG taxation. How do you feel going abroad and seeing beautiful things? Similarly, I've traveled around the world and have seen some people actually struggle for money. I've seen polluted environmental conditions, risky working health, and poor health infrastructure, yet people continue to work in these conditions, in these dangerous conditions, just for the sake of money. Banning such organizations would simply mean more unemployed people to the economy. Thus, environment, society, and economy are three interdependent parts or the three key pillars of sustainability. Historically, policies have been developed with a very straight focus on a single topic of sustainability like carbon tax, human rights policies, carbon trading, etc. But there is no policy as such which focuses on the true essence of sustainability world by considering environment, society, and economy at the same time. ESG could be a solution. Environmental social governance, which is in line with the three dimensions of the triple bottom line. Industries are actually looking forward to these kind of initiatives. Companies and investors are adopting this, which is a sign that government should take part in it by advocating for sustainable business practices. ESG tax could be a great tool to promote sustainable business culture and behavior and balance the economy at the same time. Governments can develop a unified framework for the ESG rating per industry. Following it, each company could be scored against their performance and then weighted against the industry average. Businesses with a score lower than industry average could be charged a tax called ESG tax based on the difference, while companies with a better score than average could be actually given tax credits from the government based on their sustainability performance. Winning this competition will allow my policy idea to be recognized by different stakeholders and would allow me to pursue my passion for sustainable business culture. I would need your support in this to help my voice reach to the authorities. My role here is to advocate for policy reform that can benefit the sustainable businesses while also punish the per, uh, businesses performing poorly on it. 
I want to promote a sustainable change in the business community, just like what happened in Waterloo Region with the Blue Box program. Thank you so much for giving me time today. Excellent. Uh, and I will now ask the judges to perhaps uh, turn their cameras on. Um, I have a timer here where I'm going to keep track of the five minute time limit. And I have warned the pitching teams already that I'm going to be ruthless in enforcing the end of the five minute time limit. So apologies in advance. Uh, but everybody will have the same uh, the same uh, platform to 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 take these questions from. So with that, I will uh, turn things over to the judges and to Dwee. I think I'm I'm going to start with this kind of uh, questions. Uh, first of all, congratulations on this great idea. I think it was great to to see your pitch and definitely to pat your passion for sustainability. Uh, I think my my first question is: If you were to win this, what would be the first three things that you would do with the with the funds that you would receive? Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, uh, I, I, I really have a concrete plan after this. Um, I really want to uh, see the standardized uh, framework that I'm being used in the market right now. I've seen that there are a lot of uh, indiscrepancy on the part of reporting because there are so many sustainability frameworks that people actually try to report on. So I want to combine every, uh, all these standards and create a system for the government that they can easily follow. Second thing would be to actually go to uh, different industry-led associations, or um, I've seen there are many uh, responsible investment forums uh, where um, I really want to go in and pitch uh, my idea again, just to gain support of the market. Um, I really think capital market would be very crucial um, in terms of um, you know, advocating for this. So that would be my second plan. And my last step would be to actually create um, a tech platform uh, that governments could actually use um, and rate the companies and actually decide what kind of tax would be charged on that. So these are the three next key things that I'm planning. And winning this competition would actually help me to start my journey by uh, going through events and creating the tech that we really need to. Great, I'll, I'll jump in here, Dweep. So again, I'll, I'll bookend. Uh, the, it's great to see the passion that you bring to it. And, and we need people that wanna you know, pursue that, that consistency and find different ways of, of finding a, a, a motivation for businesses to change. Um, do you see this, so I got kind of a two part question. One is, do you see this starting at a, at a municipal letter, level or trying to bring it on a, on a higher level as part one? And then part two, are you seeing the economic part of, the, of what your idea is is in that platform you spoke of? Um, sure, um, I, I'll just answer the first one first. Um, so I really want this to be like the end goal is to be like, you know, on a nationwide, um, uh, like federal level. But like, you know, my plan was like, you know, starting with each municipal governments, uh, the industries that are associated with the uh, region, uh, we can start like, you know, having a pilot program. And that's how, that's how I really want um, every government of like different levels to join in and to actually, you know, be part of a taxes and just taxation system that actually follows all the three parts of sustainability. Um, and um, sorry, can you rephrase your second question again? Sure, it's more on the, uh, the commercialization. You, you talked about a, a platform for either the government or the business to use. Do you see that as, as, a, as a business model um, side of it for, for yourself or for the company you wanna create? Uh, yes, that is right. So I really think, um, you know, going forward, um, definitely governments would not have the expertise on these kind of issues. It's a very, you know, wide range of uh, industry issues. And like when you're dealing with so many sectors at once, you definitely need um, the expertise on it. So yeah, my, my target would be the government. But like, you know, that's how I'm planning the economic um, structure of the company would be, um, I would be actually pitching it to the different levels of government. And that would be my main source of clients. And I'll add a couple just really, really quick questions. And again, you know, very good, very good presentation. Um, my question is around, you know, do you see this evolving as like a government policy around taxation? Or is it some kind of certification process that would be involved? And the second part to that, 
what do you envision as the biggest challenge for adoption? Um, sure. Um, I can definitely say there are many challenges in this, but like, you know, I'm trying to actually reform the policies that are formed here. The major problem that I'm finding with these kind of uh, ESG related issues are like there's one policy actually focusing on one part of the sustainability at a time, right? Like carbon tax, for example, it just, tar just targets like carbon emissions, like, you know, um, modern sla slavery, for example, would just tr target on the modern slavery. Like there's no policy that actually has a three component attached to it. So this is where I'm targeting a policy reform I'm that actually has like, you know, economic I'm growth. Sorry, I'm, I'm, jump, I'm jumping in to cut you off. We, we've hit the five minute mark. So uh, <laughs> apologies that we didn't get the tail end of that answer in, but uh, great work in responding to those questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the pitch. Thank you to the judges for the questions. Uh, a reminder that as we move forward, you can also add questions into the, uh, into the chat if you want to sort of add those into the mix as well. Thank you, Dweet. Great job. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how things stack up as we move along. Uh, it's now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce the second team that is pitching this evening. Uh, our second team is um, uh, called the Picnic Blanket, uh, and it's a group of students who came together in one particular class, uh, Geography ERS 460, uh, where they were looking at sustainable food issues. And the members of this team uh, include uh, Benjamin Mueller, a fourth year Geography and Environmental Management student, David Asher, uh, a fourth year Planning uh, student, Emma Badal, uh, for a third year uh, environment resources and sustainability student, and Sarah Gallego, a fourth year environment resources and sustainability student. So I will turn it over to the picnic blanket to share their particular idea with us, or I will turn it over to the video of the picnic blanket before we bring them in. Have you ever tasted something that takes you back to a childhood memory? This happened to me recently when I had made beef kofta. It took me back to my granny's kitchen table where we would enjoy and talk about food. Well, she passed away and I'm unable to share this memory with her anymore. And after 99 years of being around, it kind of took for granted that she would always be there. So I realized that I wasn't gonna be the only one who had lost access to this traditional food knowledge of procuring, preserving, preparing, and sharing our food. When I introduced this concept to some of my colleagues who are creative, socially and environmentally conscious, we came up with the idea inspired by an underused picnic blanket to represent our open invitation to our table and to our ideas to help improve the access to the KW region that we live in. So our mission became to assist the community uh, improve its access to these sustainable food re uh, food options and resources that are available to them while still being culturally compassionate. When we had wanted to tackle this, we decided to use a multifaceted approach that was simple, compassionate, and included uh, traditional simple forms of uh, knowledge transfer. So the first aspect is a children's book. Now this story is a multi-generational immigrant story that lives right here in the KW region, and them uh, navigating the KW food system. We have a completed draft of this book with illustrations and editing notes. The second aspect that we have is we've already published our first series of seven episodes of a podcast that provides academic background and practical application of these, these concepts and issues that are discussed throughout the book. The last part is, the, is a companion website that, uh, that hosts all of our material, links, maps, and also provides a discussion board and social, and social connections so that, the, the, <clears throat> so that the, the sustainable resources can be better shared. The book, podcast, and website are intended to be uh, reapplied and used as a template for other communities. With the Jack Rosen support, we'd be allowed to invite the right people onto our table, onto the picnic blanket to help us complete our mission and get this book into children's hands as fast as possible. Thank you for your consideration of the picnic blanket. Excellent, and I would now invite the members of uh, the picnic blanket team to uh, turn on their cameras and uh, unmute their microphones and I will turn things over to the judges. Again, a reminder, questions in the chat are welcome. 
Uh, and I will start the time rolling once the first judge begins to ask a question. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll start with this one. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the narrative uh, approach to your pitch. Uh, so, you know, very well done. Um, my question is, what do you see as some of the monetization opportunities here? And how would you envision this initiative to look like in say three to five years from now? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so we're kind of exploring different revenue models right now. One was that we would make it, um, it, it would just be free, like the book would be free online. Uh, the other option that we were exploring is um, trying to get things like school boards or municipalities to, um, I guess, like purchase uh, the book in different quantities. And then that would kind of fund our um, the website through a sort of nonprofit model. And so what we're hoping as this sort of template that we've created grows, um, other kind of communities will um, follow suit because the idea is that um, we've created the basic outline of the story that any other community can replicate with um, place-based resources in there. Just wanted to jump in that definitely that it's the, the, the book sales, uh, either hard or soft cover, and then also revenue can be generated through our ad traffic on our website as it becomes a resource to the community. So hopefully then more people will be wanting to have access to it. If I may, I'm just going to jump in and I think a little bit following up on Paul's question. How would you make sure to bring attention to kind of these tools? How would you disseminate, you know, just to make sure that people go to your tools and actually kind of see them, you know, read them. Yeah, uh, so we have uh, some different ideas of how we want to get our story out there. Um, one is we are planning to have a social media presence through our book. We wanted to incorporate a sort of uh, almost like a scavenger hunt in your municipality to visit some of the places that you would be sourcing this local food from. And we would hope that through kind of spreading the information through, I guess, more like informal networks, kind of, you know, through the, like through social media, through word of mouth, but also trying to get it into those classroom presentations, um, kind of, you know, like bring, bringing the book into class and, um, or maybe getting kids to bring the book home with them. And then um, having communities of parents come together around these books. And then I, I just have one quick question. Hopefully it's within our five minutes. Um, is uh, do you see the, the content on the website being for the being for the parents or for the, the kids themselves? That's something we, we discussed as a group because we wanted it to be for both. Um, the companion website is intended to provide the parents with the academic research and knowledge in a um, in a per, in a way that it's it, accessible to them, but also that there's a way that they can explain that to their children. And hopefully that there's a, a section on there that they'll be able to show them in imagery or, or in a way that they can figure it out there. So yeah, the website is both for, for the children and for the adults, but I think it also connects to our audience that listens to our podcast, which is the younger generation that are where would the applicable information is there. So the map of where to find these things would be also the draw to the website as to how to find this stuff in your region. And then a quick follow up. Do you, do you see there being an opportunity for a sharing community amongst those parents, whether it's recipes or, or what have you? Is that kind of the vision? Absolutely, yeah. We are trying to build a community around our food, and that's why you know the whole idea of our picnic blanket is that it's open, and we're trying to get families to you know go to each other's picnic blankets. Um, so the name choice there was really um, deliberate and symbolic of that. And I just wanted to mention that uh, with the draft that we have with the book, that is also our ending. So it basically begins with the story of a family and their journeys throughout getting that community feeling uh, with the rest of the people uh, through food, basically. We probably do have time for one more quick question. Well, I can definitely go again. Um, so <laughs> do you do you see that, like what your current um, stats on your podcast, can, can you give us an idea of kind of how many people you click, how long they're sticking around? Do you have that data yet? Um, yes, we do. However, as of right now, we have not marketed the podcast. Okay. 
but um, yes, um, there are 30 views, <laughs> but it's not marketed. Something we're sort of envisioning is that when the parents are reading the book to their children, that they're interested and want to learn more. And, that and that's David, what they're sorry, going to do. I'm, I'm jumping in to cut you off the same way that I did. We, we snuck that last question in there. So you did get a little more information out, but uh, sorry, sorry that I, uh, I, I then pulled it away from you there. But uh, thank you very much to uh, the picnic blanket. Uh, I always I always tell this team that you know when I hear them talk it always makes me hungry so so that may be a sign that there's some really good ideas coming to the fore here uh, so thank you very much uh, for for that second pitch uh, and I will um, again sort of move towards the next team in the competition a reminder that if you are not on the pitching team to uh, turn off your mics uh, mute uh, or turn off your cameras mute your mics. Uh, and we'll move forward to team number three. The third team pitching tonight is called No Sup, uh, Sup uh, S U P uh, for single use plastic. Uh, and their project is about eliminating single use plastic waste in Canadian supermarkets. Presenting for team No Sup this evening is Karen Farley. And Karen is a second year graduate student in sustainability management. So we will watch her video and then we'll uh, turn things over to her for questions. Imagine going shopping for food and coming home without that mountain of disposable plastic packaging. Canada is over-reliant on single-use plastic in food packaging, making it really difficult to buy plastic-free food in supermarkets today. Of the 3.3 million metric tons of plastic disposed in Canada each year, 16% is single-use food packaging. That's enough compacted plastic waste to fill the Rogers Centre. Only 9% is recycled, and plastic is projected to increase by 30% over the next decade. Three quarters of Canadian consumers support a ban on single-use food packaging. 20% are green consumers who actively seek out sustainable products. Canada's food industry, worth $27 billion per year, recognizes consumers as drivers of the shift to sustainable packaging models. Academic research and industry reports produce generalized consumer trends, while in-house consumer surveys are mainly concerned with customer opinion that informs marketing. Also, consumer research focuses on profitability rather than positive environmental impact. As the founder of a food production company, I observed the industry has little motivation to change aside from the benefits of green marketing or to prepare for future regulation. So what if consumers had a way to tell the food industry they want more plastic-free food? No Sub Canada is developing a mobile app that amplifies the voice of the consumer to tackle the issue of plastic waste generated by food packaging. Consumers will use the app while food shopping to capture their experiences or failures purchasing plastic-free food. NOSUP will provide industry customers with real insight into consumer purchasing decisions on an on-demand and subscription basis as evidence of support to eliminate single-use food packaging. This year, NOSUP will complete industry validation, develop a prototype app with MyTax funding, and begin social media outreach to consumers. In 2023, the mobile app will be launched for ongoing data collection with first sales to food retailers, manufacturers, and packaging suppliers from July. NOSUP was founded in October 2021 by me, Karen Farley, a sustainability researcher with previous ventures in systems development and food production. The $3,000 prize from Jack Rosen will fund our initial social media campaign, and we are also seeking industry contacts. By amplifying the voice of Canadian consumers Plastic-free food shopping could indeed become a reality. Thank you. And an excellent uh, video. Uh, great to see Karen there. You've already sort of brought your camera up. I'll invite the judges to bring their cameras up as well. Uh, and once we have that first question, I will start the clock rolling on our next five minute time slot. I'll go first this time, then I can get out of the way. Um, when uh, Karen, so nice, nice presentation and, and, and very clear as to what you're trying to do. Uh, I believe is the revenue model for the consumer to pay the subscription or is it for the food companies? Where do you see the, the revenue from? Good question. The uh, app will be free for users. 
um, so for consumers. And the revenue will come from um, selling the data and reports to the industry. So food manufacturers, retailers, and packaging suppliers. Thank you. Uh, hi, Karen. Uh, well done. And good job defining where you want to use the funds and asking for help in the industry. Um, you know, it's a, you know, very good qualities of uh, an interesting pitch and, you know, a, a, an idea that you have to, to pursue. My, my question is around on the app itself, do you have some notion of how many app users you need and how you would promote to get the, the downloads and stuff? And do you see that there is opportunities beyond other areas, like beyond plastics and into other grocery and food type um, initiatives? It's like you're reading my mind, Paul. Um, certainly in terms of app users, I don't have a fixed number in mind, but initially with the prototype, I am planning on testing it with 100 to 200 um, users. Um, and then expand from there um, towards that 75% of Canadian consumers who are looking to, to uh, eliminate single-use plastic. Um, in terms of where I see it going in the future, um, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, there's plastic in all types of packaging. So there are opportunities to expand this to other consumer goods, uh, cleaning products and other areas within supermarkets, but also beyond that. Um, it's certainly not something that is, needs to be limited to Canada either. Uh, plan. It's a, a universal problem that we have around the world. So I am looking at opportunities for partnerships and expansion uh, in North America and beyond. Excellent. Great, great idea, Karen, and you know, very nice pitch. I have kind of a two side uh, question. Hopefully Brock is not gonna come online soon. Uh, from the consumer perspective, right? Like I go to do my groceries, normally I go like no time. How, like what would it kind of invite me to use this app, but to spend some time as I'm buying to kind of put in press things uh, to get the information into the app. And on the other side, as an industry, like, yeah, maybe I'll get this information. How would you kind of uh, ensure that they take into account the information that you're putting forward to them regarding the plastic use? Yeah, Georgina, I definitely have to consider both sides of that. Um, certainly for app users, there is an element to which the 20% the of green consumers, people like myself, are, I believe are really looking for an avenue to uh, feed this information back into the system. You know, we go to the supermarket and we make choices every day about what we will and won't buy. And sometimes those choices require compromise. Um, but I am also going to you know, build in uh, some gamification or incentive-based um, opportunities within the app as well. Um, in terms of the industry um, customers, I do believe the industry wants to change and they're looking for the evidence to make that change. And if I can present this in terms of an opportunity, um, not only opportunity to do the right thing environmentally, but also in terms of expanding market share to people who are looking for sustainably packaged products, um, I think there will be interest in that. Thank you, thank you very much. We do have time for one more if there's another question. I guess, uh, Brad. No, yeah. go for it. Okay, go, go, it. go, you know, in terms of your kind of social media strategy, what exactly are you thinking about? So there's an element of advocacy here. Um, and to start off with, I am planning um, to focus on the app users to build that base. Um, I think Paul also asked about this a little earlier. So I'm gonna develop a social media around Facebook, Instagram um, marketing, as well as a blog that um, I'm, I'm currently working on. And um, there's also the need to expand that into the business side. So for food industry and developing um, more of a LinkedIn presence as well as Twitter and other avenues to reach the food industry. Um, but a lot of it will also be with, through word of mouth, I think, once people start to hear about yes, it. Um, hit the five-minute mark. So. That was my word. Thank you. <laughs> that was a, it was a perfect perfect timing there, Karen. Great job on, on the questions. Great job on the pitch. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for all the work that went into this. Uh, I'm going to move on to the fourth team at this point. 
Our uh, fourth um, team is called uh, Drop Point Waste Solutions, uh, and their project is Drop Point Waste Receiver. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the presenter for this particular team, Justin Shukri Sukar, who is a third year environment resources and sustainability student. Uh, so let's watch Justin's video and then we'll bring the, the judges and the cameras back up for the Q&A portion. Of it. As a university student, I've experienced living in several apartments and one particular issue that has stood out to me has been the excessive amount of waste disposed in the building's shared dumpster. After talking to some landlords, the most common issues were found to be waste disposal from people that were not living in the building and the lack of recycling from residents. Instead, simply putting everything into a dumpster, which often has no limits. A case study on apartment buildings in Toronto found that only 14% of the disposed material was actually waste. The more waste thrown out means more money spent for our disposal pickups, resulting in more waste entering our landfills. This linear cycle is extremely harmful to our environment and economically unsustainable, with valuable materials being thrown away before they can be repurposed and unnecessary fees being paid by landlords, which in turn may influence the price we pay as tenants for our rent. There is currently a lack of systems in place to monitor the waste from residents living in apartment buildings. Drop Point Waste Solutions seeks to address the issue of poor monitoring in the space. Our smart collection system is unlocked through a keypad entry system, and waste entering the system is then weighted through a connected scale and uploaded into a database that records the amount of waste received from the user. Residents will have access to their own disposal data through an app, allowing them to set eco-conscious goals of reducing their own waste and having real-time measurements to keep them accountable. This information will also be accessible for the landlord to monitor the building's disposal trends. With an educational background in sustainability and work experience with a regional waste management division, I am passionate in creating system change for a better environment. My goal with DrawPoint Waste Solutions is to provide landlords with informative data that can be used to measure material and cost savings. Along with a unique disposal system, our service includes maintenance and a cloud storage of analytical waste data reports. Funding received for this venture will assist in my plan to complete research. Beginning with the pilot program, I intend to use three apartment buildings to acquire varying data. My first step includes conducting a 12-month waste audit to gather baseline data while working to create a prototype. For the next 12 months, I plan on implementing our disposal system into these three buildings and comparing data to our baseline study with the traditional dumpsters. Going forward, I will use this information to identify any progress made in reducing waste and costs. After making any adjustments, I plan to begin pitching to landlords within the Waterloo region and eventually scaling to Ontario and across Canada. Through the efforts and initiatives from Jack Rosen helping to start the first Blue Bin program in Waterloo, the way we see and dispose of our waste has been reimagined. Draw Point Waste Solutions seeks to carry on a tradition of revolutionizing our waste management systems and striving towards a future of zero waste. Excellent. And I'll uh, invite Justin to uh, turn his camera and his microphone on and our judges again. And I will reset the clock to begin once, uh, once the first question starts from the judges. I'll jump in. Um, Justin, you know, great idea. I think, you know, we've all had that apartment that you leave your apartment and that you see exactly those pictures. Like I could just see myself, you know, during my undergrad watching that. Um, what is the cost and, and, you know, cost versus revenue, right? Like, like these big things, you know, they're going to have a cost associated to it. So where are you getting the revenue back from it? Yeah, so I've done the analysis of the cost and estimates of um, the the system with all components um, designed into it. And my current idea to um, retrieve revenue from these landlords um, that utilize the system would be through a monthly service uh, subscription fee. So this fee would not only rent the physical bin and the system, but would also pay for a software service with cloud storage to for landlords to retrieve data and analytical reports on like weekly, monthly, and yearly um, data reports on the waste that's being accumulated in the building. And that landlord would also be able to share that software service to, to the tenants so that they would have access to, um, to this data information. Uh, go ahead, are you ready, Paul? Go ahead. Sure, I'll ask uh, just a really quick question. 
one of the things that really you know stood out was one of the stats that you had that one of the the number one problem is waste from non-residents. Um, and, and I wonder how much that plays into your strategy, into um, pitching this to, you know, to the customers. And the second part of that, is your customer the landlord or the providers of waste bins? I'm not sure how that um, relationship between those two things happen. Yeah, great question, Paul. So I'll start with the latter question. Um, so our uh, plan is to um, focus the buyer uh, with the landlord because these waste bins are, they can be manufactured and purchased separately. Um, currently, big waste management industry companies are using their own bins as um, a rental service and their bins are unique to their own company, um, even though they're manufactured through an isolated um, outsource company. So our main focus is to uh, create the system using a bin and specify that uh, to the buyer, which is landlords across uh, across the region. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, could you repeat your first question, please? Uh, the, the first was uh, the, one of the main problems being uh, waste from non-residents and, you know, how much All is right. that part of your value proposition to to the landlords? Yes. Yeah, so after speaking with some landlords and a large issue um, that they're dealing with is that waste is being accumulated too quickly in their bins and they're having to call disposal services to get it empty because residents outside the building are um, contributing to the shared dumpster. So mm -hmm. a way to eliminate this in conjunction with tracking waste um, is to have that keypad system, which, which is a unique identifier for each tenant living in the building. And so with that, um, with that, uh, as a tenant in the building, you're getting access to a, a four digit code to access that bin. So this would limit that bin to tenants living in the building only. Outside, outside um, residents would not be able to access it without a code. So it limits garbage and uh, can eventually save landlord from having to um, call in those disposal services when the bin gets filled up too fast. And I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Justin. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a tough market that you go in and disruptive. And I and I love that because I love disrupting um, and I've disrupted this the waste management side in, in my past. Um, just as part of your scaling plan to be able to scale quickly, have you ever considered uh, just having the app? And, and licensing the technology, if you will, either to another manufacturer, just so you can go faster and manage your revenue stream on the application of the data and the feedback to landlords. Yeah, I've considered uh, collaborations in at least the public sector. And a large problem with that is that um, apartment buildings are considered a business, They're not considered technically uh, like low density residential areas. So that collaboration would be difficult um, on a policy scale as public sector, we need to adjust um, what they accept for managing waste. And within the, within the private sector, as you mentioned, this is largely a disruptive innovation. And within the waste management industry, there's currently um, um, these kind of top, these top dogs in the industry and they, and they currently run systems uh, that are more traditional in their, man, in their favor. And often these systems actually require and oh. Justin, I'm going to uh, cut you off right there. So uh, <laughs> I, I think we got a sense of where you were going. Uh, great responses to the questions that came your way. So thank you very much uh, for, for that pitch. But I am going to move forward to our fifth uh, group uh, pitching this evening. Uh, our fifth team is called Ameliorator Enterprises Unlimited. And the name of their project is Get Ripped for the Apocalypse. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Amelia Merhar, uh, who is a PhD student in geography and environmental management, who will be presenting for this team. So let's watch Amelia's video. My name is Amelia Merhar, and my pitch for the Jack Rosen competition is get ripped for the apocalypse. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in human geography, and I'm presenting for Ameliorator Enterprises. The problem I'm addressing is eco-anxiety. As you can see from this fabulous meme, getting depression and anxiety from climate change. That's not what we want. But unfortunately, that is where we are for a lot of students and a lot of people in general. Finally having a purpose in life. That's what we're aiming for. 
another world is possible. Get ready, get prepped, and get ripped for the apocalypse. We have a team of underemployed graduate student researchers teaching you the methods of survival. It's okay to breathe through your mouth when you're getting ripped for the apocalypse. Getting ripped for the apocalypse teaches you workouts for each of the nightmare scenarios. Climate change, peak oil, nuclear war, zombies, magnetic pole reversal, and so much more. All body types are welcome, and good dogs too. Get ready, get prepped, get ripped for the apocalypse. Why fitness, comedy, and art? Without the energy to do the work necessary to address all these potential apocalyptic scenarios, even the best policy options, programs, and ideas are moot. Art and fitness can lift us up. We can fight, punch, and kick our way to a better future. Humor is the entry point here to a really overwhelming and complicated issue. Hashtag Greta unites prepper culture, retro aesthetics, and education for a very unique product. The full trailer, which you saw clips of, has screened at three film festivals, two of which were paid. There's already a website. There's already some merchandise. You can see I've got little barbell earrings that say Fit Life. The only thing holding this project up has been the funding to produce a full episode. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to finding that funding. Thank you for your time. Excellent. And I'll invite Amelia. Oh, she's there ahead of me already with the camera and the microphone on. And I'll bring our judges back as we uh, take a closer look at this particular pitch. Uh, judges, over to you. I'll fire up, I'll fire up first. <laughs> Sorry. Well, uh, first off, I love the humor. Um, big, uh, big fan of it. We built a, a big part of True Earth on, on humor, and that's what we we need right now is to to bring that element to it. So I love that part. I'm I think a little bit. You maybe help me understand where the revenue model is. Is this a, a subscription? Is this uh, getting people to view the the video? Uh, can you help me with that? For sure. So um, in terms of the revenue model. Uh, I want the videos to be free online, um, and I plan on selling small merchandise like headbands, fanny packs, um, tying into the retro culture aesthetics. And then I'm also actually want to take Get Ripped for the Apocalypse and have it be a team building corporate exercise because there's all these, um, it's a way to bring in a significant amount of revenue and also have an afternoon with uh, a group of people do some team building, do some work outside, and also provide education on various environmental issues and uh, scenarios that we need to prepare for and learn about. Yeah, in interesting. I I I love the I love the energy. Um, so it's kind of along that lines. My question is like, what's your vision? Is it to build a company, a lifestyle? a movement and how do you measure the success? Like if you, what's your one big milestone for success into moving things forward? Hmm. Well, seeing as this is like an art project, um, it's a film project as well and fitness and education, we live in a bountiful land of grants. And so um, after, if, when I successfully complete a pilot episode, after that, I am eligible for a lot of money to pay for really good production and to have these videos out there. And I do want a bit of like a, a fitness movement. I really enjoy uniting preppers and fitness culture because that has only ever happened sometimes in a CrossFit class, you know? Like, <laughs> and I think connecting with students, um, this project is really inspired by teaching climate change uh, fundamentals for six semesters and my students just had so much anxiety about the world they are inheriting and I'm hoping with these 20 minute episodes it can just help people do that that workout that they know will make them feel better in an accessible manner but also help them understand 
how to survive um, and how do you take care of their family members who you know have mobility issues when we are dealing with whether it's flooding or extreme weather events or zombies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a little bit to follow up on that. Uh, what do you think? What do you think are going to be the the biggest challenge to engage people? You know, to, to join this kind of movement that you want. I don't have a problem engaging with people. Every time I post about this project, I have like all my friends are like, "When can I be in an episode?" Um, so that part is is good. Um, I think pulling the team together on the social media end. Like I have I have all the handles locked for Instagram and Twitter. I have a website already. Um, but pulling that team together because I have the film and the fitness and I have some experts, my doctor is willing to do a little doctor intro. Um, yeah, pulling together, uh, a team to really do a huge social media strategy, as opposed to what I've been doing right now, which is just posting and people loving it and having it be in film festivals. Thank you. And just kind of, you know, I just kind of, one of your, your slides said, you know, you're already making money, you mm -hmm. know, is that just selling kind of uh, all the merchandise that you put in there, you know? That's mainly been from film screening fees. So I've already covered the costs of the full trailer and the websites and um, the, the merchandise. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm like making a bunch of money, but I'm definitely already covering my costs and, and then some. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the, the timing of this was, was, was almost perfect. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, that's, that's especially important when I guess you're, you're producing videos, you got to be sort of uh, conscious of those timelines. So uh, let's move forward to our sixth and final team for this evening. The team is Barrett Sustainable Solutions. Their project is the Sustainable Produce Bag Program and presenting for team number six will be Sam Barrett. Sam is a fourth year geography and environmental management student. Uh, and uh, let's watch his video and then we'll bring Sam to, uh, to, to meet the judges. Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Sam Barrett, and I'm here to present you my alternative produce bag program for the Jack Rosen virtual pitch competition. Imagine yourself after a busy day at work, going to the store to pick up a few groceries. You don't need a cart, you'll be fine, right? If you're anything like my dad and tend to impulse shop a little bit, once you head to get your fruits and veggies, you'll probably end up using a few of those plastic film produce bags. You put your produce in the bags, bring them home, and throw them out. These bags often go straight to landfill after a single use, due to their inability to be reused, and the alternative of recycling them has proved challenging, due to significant infrastructure costs and their ability to tangle and damage the machines. Our solution to this problem entails an alternative program with the implementation of organic cotton produce bags for sale in grocery stores across Canada. These bags have the ability to be reused numerous times and can then be composted at the end of their useful lives. With the upcoming single-use plastic span on plastic grocery bags, this program aims to capitalize on growing consumer awareness towards sustainability. Customers bringing their reusable bags just to fill them with plastic produce bags seems a bit pointless, right? The implementation of this program would present customers with several low-cost purchasing options in the produce section at their local grocery store. Four bags for $7, eight bags for $12, and 12 bags for $20. Additionally, a five-cent fee would be placed on the plastic produce bags, along with their presence in the produce section gradually being scaled down in order to promote the shift towards our sustainable alternatives and prevent plastic waste from entering landfills. As a result, we take advantage of the single-use plastic span and create a seamless transition with our alternative bag in order to facilitate and further develop shopping experiences with less reliance on single-use plastics. Our ideal integration of this program would entail collaborative partnerships with the major Canadian grocery corporations, Loblaw, Metro, and Empire. While the Empire-owned Farm Boy chain has implemented a similar program with their bags made of 100% polyester, they would end up in landfill at the end of their useful life. In order to promote our program to these corporations, we would stress the corporate social responsibility benefits, the long-term cost savings, and the ability to reduce plastic waste. I believe this program has the potential to reap multiple environmental and social benefits in grocery stores across Canada, and in order to make an effective transition away from the traditional plastic produce bag, 
The next step would be the creation of a pilot project, which would entail research on the number of current plastic produce bags used within a designated time period, regulatory and legal issues of implementing the program, changes in customer behavior, particularly with the adaptability to the new bags, and beginning to outsource our produce bags from a selected manufacturer. I believe with this alternative produce bag program, we can achieve the same ideals Jack Rosen aimed to achieve in his pursuit in creating the world's first blue box program. Thank you for your time. Excellent, uh, great video again. And uh, Sam, I see you're, you're live and ready. So let me turn things over to the judges. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, very well done. I love these ideas where you are solving something that is obvious to everyone and there's not a really good solution out there. I'd buy one of these bags just so I don't have to struggle opening those little plastic things. Um, but my question is, why do you think this hasn't already been done on a large scale? And do you have a, a good sense of the investment that's required to get to a prototype? I think this hasn't been done yet because it's just so easy and convenient for these grocery store chains to buy these huge rolls of plastic foam bags and not have to worry about restocking reusable uh, produce bags because Farm Boy, they, they've done it. Um, I was actually in Superstore last weekend and I noticed they had 12 rolls of these plastic film rolls. And in the corner, if I wasn't looking for them, they had five reusable polyester produce bags. So uh, I think they, it's just um, the investment um, may be too much for them, but I think long-term the cost savings of this um, can really make a difference because once they're bringing the money in from these reusable bags, um, they won't have to buy these plastic film rolls anymore. Um, and in terms of investment, um, I haven't done the research yet on what would be required, uh, but my uh, initial um, research has found that I would need um, some idea of like how many produce bags people use, um, like the plastic ones in a typical store visit, and then I'd probably go from there. Thanks. I think I'll jump, you know, just thinking about the consumer aspect, I can I can tell you I have some of those mesh bags at home, but every time I go to the grocery, I forget them at home, right? So, how, like, you know, I think the consumer will need some, some sort of incentive to bring these bags back to the store, because if not, we're just going to be piling up mesh, mesh bags at home and then kind of going to whatever the grocery store is offering you. Have you thought about, you know, this incentive for consumers? Yeah, I've been thinking because the single use plastics ban is coming up obviously in Canada and it's targeting the grocery bags, but not uh, the produce bags. So uh, by the end of the year, people aren't gonna be able to use their plastic grocery bags. So I'm trying to capitalize on them beginning to bring their uh, reusable grocery bags in conjunction with these produce bags. So I'll, I'll build on that a little bit, Sam. So if um, I'm in the same camp as Georgina and that I've got a bunch of them uh, and I forget them every time. So I'll often just walk up with three lemons and throw them on the, on the countertop. Have you ever considered if you're going to try and go with the uh, collaboration with the retail store themselves, is in either some kind of uh, deposit and refund type of scenario where someone could take two today and then they bring back two and they get their deposit back and and, and is that something that you could uh, consider as part of your model yeah i also had i had like two different models for this so i also had a model where bags would cost five cents like there would just be a pile of them in the produce section bags would be five cent deposit you take them you can bring them back, but sometimes you'll keep them at home. When you remember them, you can bring them back. You can get the five cents. So it's just um, a continual process. So um, for this, I chose the purchasing option, but I also had an option like that with the deposit as well. There is a little more time for another question. I'll do one, one more. Um, on some of them, just on your kind of go-to-market strategy of your testing, um, some of the, the smaller chains like a, a Whole Foods might be a just kind of a 
advice for lack of a better word, a good uh, test pilot for you to ask them because they had a smaller number of stores and they got the sweet spot of the environmental um, consumer. So have you considered where you're going to enter for this test? I actually um, considered Sobeys because Sobeys has, they're already a bit ahead of the curve than other grocery stores. They don't offer the plastic bags anymore. They actually offer paper. So that was one of my um, more ideal targets for this, like a pilot project. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, great, uh, great job wrapping up the pitches. Uh, we've heard from all six teams now. So now the, uh, the difficult work for the judges begins. So um, Paul, uh, Georgina, Brad, uh, you, you have a task in front of you and, and we've obviously placed some time limits on you too because uh, uh, I've seen some of these pitch competitions where the deliberation lasts a couple of hours, but uh, we, we have forced you to come up with a decision fairly quickly. So I will uh, bid you uh, au revoir for the moment. We'll, we'll see you again in a few minutes time when you've reached a decision, uh, but they're going off to a separate, uh, a separate uh, online uh, space now to, uh, to discuss the pitches that they've heard uh, and to make some selections for the winners. So in the meantime, uh, for those of us that are still here, let me first congratulate the teams that pitched. Uh, we, we heard about eco-anxiety in Amelia's pitch. Uh, you, you have pitch anxiety now, I'm sure, all six teams, and, and waiting to hear the resolution of this is probably not helping that. But let me say that all six of you, all six teams did a, did a great job, and that uh, there's certainly some, uh, some interesting stuff for the judges to, to mull over and consider at this stage of things. But while they are doing that, uh, I want to invite uh, members of last year's winning team to come and share uh, some thoughts and ideas with us. Last year's winning team was DECOMP, uh, an organic plastic waste disposal solution that utilizes bioreactor technology to create and maintain the optimal growing conditions for plastic degrading microbes to facilitate the degradation of plastics in weeks as opposed to hundreds of years. Uh, and I'm happy, happy to welcome some of the team members uh, back to join us. Uh, DECOMP, as I say, won this competition last year. I think they're going to tell us about some of the other things that they've been involved in since this, since that time. But I want to welcome uh, Isabella Deneko, uh, Munira Lakdawala, and Haya Almerhebi to uh, share with us some of the elements of their entrepreneurial journey, some of the successes, challenges, uh, and, and most importantly, the lessons about perseverance that they may have learned over the course of the last year. Last year. So let me turn it over to you for a few minutes, and we look forward to kind of hearing about the journey you've been on. For me, this was my first pitch competition last year, and I think it's the same for Isabella. So it was a very reminiscing um, kind of experience getting to watch everyone pitch again. Um, and I really appreciate um, being here. Thank you for inviting us. And um, all the pitches were incredible, and I wish you all the best. Um, as Brock said, that we will be kind of explaining the challenges and our journey so far, but just for those who don't know us, we're gonna go into a little bit of a background into what Decomp is and yeah, let's go. <laughs> so the Jack Rosen competition has had so many positive impacts and this is for those that win, those that don't win, this is applicable to everyone. So just to go into it, um, yeah. So first of all, this competition has provided us with a great set of mentors and opportunities. Um, Brock Dickinson is one of our mentors and we are very blessed to be able to have him on our panel uh, to help us out in our journey. Um, we've also been able to network and make connections and kind of understand more of you know, the insight in the relevant industries. Um, one thing that I do recommend is the feedback that the judges give is the best criticism that you can get because it really helps you shape um, your project or idea to be as successful as, possi as pos possible. And that's what we've done. It's also an amazing platform to pitch your ideas and you get to see other people kind of have these ambitious um, ideas that are very similar to yours and they can give you some inspiration. And the final thing is the funding and the recognition has kind of given us the platform to go and perform in other pitch competitions. The name of the Jack Rosen competition also like gives us the credibility, which is 
amazing when you go to investors, um, you want to go for a pilot project. So it's been great. So what is decomp? Um, we are a plastic pollution, uh, we are a organic um, plastic waste disposal solution that utilizes pla proprietary plastic degrading microbes, um, which are placed in a bioreactor. And through our management solution, we are able to degrade plastic in weeks as compared to up to hundreds of years, which is the natural way for plastic to degrade. And unlike the competition, um, the way that we manage and dispose of plastic, it does not affect um, global health and environmental health. So a little bit of information on the industry that we work in. Um, material recovery facilities referred to as MRFs. They're facilities that pick up waste for processing. So think of a MRF as a waste management facility. Um, so we have different ways in which we dispose and manage of plastics. The first way is recycling. Not all plastics are recyclable and only plastics with minimal contamination can be recycled. Um, contaminated plastic waste could be incinerated, but that has adverse health effects on those that live around these places um, that burn the plastic. And municipalities, they're implementing mandates on the amount of waste that MRFs must divert from landfills tracked by diversion rates. And so, even that by diverting the, the plastic, we won't be able, they won't be able to reach their, the mandates that have been set by the municipalities. So our solution is we're utilizing plastic degrading microbes, which will be housed in a bioreactor. Um, the microbes will be genetically engineered to increase their efficiency at breaking down these plastics. Um, we're going to be starting by focusing on LDPEs just because they aren't recyclable or they're generally not recycled and they're one of the most produced um, plastic resins. MRFs have said that, you know, a solution like decomp is very um, integral to kind of tackling plastic pollution, especially in Canada. Um, but our plan is to not only focus on LDPEs, it's all plastics, um, which we get to our competition. Um, so there are many different ways of degrading, getting rid of plastic, but they don't come with, you know, assisting MRFs with the diversion of rate mandates. They're not environmentally friendly and they're not tackling all plastic waste. Um, our biggest competitor is the status quo, but they aren't Tackle, planning to tackle all plastic waste, which we plan to do. And so that's just a little bit of information and we'll pan to Isabella now. Yeah, so when pitching last year, we emphasized how a uh, strength of our team is our diversity. So each of our members of our team have a little bit of a different journey of being involved with DCOMP. So DCOMP was founded by Gabriel Saunders in the last year of his MBET program as his like final project. He wanted to continue to see what DCOMP could grow to if he could make this solution a reality and reached out to other resources to help him. I heard about DCOMP through Engineers Without Borders and joined the team around like similar times as Haya and Manira. And then we're the team who pitched last year. But even then there was other members who are kind of working behind the scenes or have joined since they've seen the traction, um, that traction that DCOMP has been able to take. <laughs> Uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about like the new members and their involvement on the team or the members that have been with DCOMP for quite some time. So Isha has been a biology student from the University of Waterloo and she's been a pretty strongly involved for a while. Uh, she's really helped lead the development of our plans for in-lab testing. So we have done a lot of research and done a lot of background work to prove that this solution might be possible. And now that we're finally being able to get in labs, Isha has done a great job of helping us put together an exper experimental procedure for that. Um, Carlton and Elijah heard about us through uh, different pitch competitions. So another example of why 
opportunities like Jack Rosen's competitions is so excellent. Like you get to connect with other people who are passionate about similar things. And they've been really helpful working on the research and development of our solution. Um, oh, something else I wanted to mention about Isha's involvement is that she was involved with St. Paul's um, like social impact. Like, I want to make sure I don't mess it up. St. Paul's Greenhouse Social Impact Incubator, which I'm sure like many of you have heard of. But if you haven't, that's a really great place to grow your ideas for sustainability, um, gain a lot of opportunities and network with other like-minded people trying to make their ideas a reality. Um, and then DCOM's also been involved with Ryerson University's Social Venture Zone, which connected us with Chio. Um, Chio joined us as an intern. He has a background in medical physics from Ryerson University and has been also helping with the like microbial research that we've been doing um, to get ready to perform our in-lab testing. Like any startup, we've faced a ton of challenges and I think all of us are experiencing a lot of unique challenges with the pandemic. Uh, we've been working remotely, which I'm, I know you guys all can relate to and are very familiar with the different challenges of that. I've never met Manira and Haya in person. I, I don't think we have. I met Isha once and that's all. Um, so that can lead to some challenges with communication or even just Zoom fatigue, like being students, being in class, all day and then joining on a call for decomp it, it can be pretty demanding when your plates are pretty full um, and another challenge with the pandemic was trying to secure lab space so our solution is pretty technical there's a lot of science that needs to be done and when like lab spaces were fully closed that made it really challenging and then it was only open for like essential people that is also difficult to secure that kind of space so it's really nice that campus is opening back up we're able to really pick up the progress um, another point that we wanted to bring up is we would love like the opportunity to get in inside these material recovery facilities in person and get a better understanding of the waste disposal process and of course that hasn't been super possible um, right now Another thing like I just wanted to talk about briefly about like my experience with decomp is that like being involved in a student student entrepreneur entrepreneurship role and trying to see how far you can take an idea is just has been a really, really great opportunity. Um, and I think there's a lot of challenges when trying to do that, as I, as I said. Uh, I, I feel like most people, especially at the University of Waterloo, everyone is so busy and trying to manage your time and persevere when there are roadblocks is so challenging. Um, startups, you're always facing, yeah, either roadblocks, setbacks, milestones get delayed. And the one thing that I think made it a lot easier to persevere is because we're working on a problem we're passionate about. All the problems that other presenters make made today are really serious, important environmental problems. And when you're passionate about those problems, it's a lot easier to persevere. And if you believe in your idea, I think it's a lot easier to, to really make traction. Um, so other than our team growing, uh, DCOMP has further propelled uh, thanks to the Jack Rosen competition. Um, DECOM has been successfully selected as the winner of the Commission for Environmental Corporations Youth Innovation Challenge um, representing Canada. The contest is uh, hosted by the Commission for Environmental Co Cooperation, which invites uh, North American youth um, to propose innovative solutions uh, to help communities become more adaptive to climate change, as well as cultivate equal access to a healthy environment for all, especially those who are underprivileged and vulnerable in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Um, moreover, through winning the Jack Rosen competition, we were guided by our mentor, Brock Dickinson, um, in participating for the World's Challenge Challenge um, at uh, University of Waterloo. We were able to gain a very valuable experience and uh, were nominated as the winner for the World's Challenge Challenge competition. Um, eventually, we were also um, nominated as one of the 10 semifinalists for the International 
World's Challenge Challenge among 22 different teams that were competing globally. So our team is currently in the process of researching plastic degrading microbes and analyzing uh, what would be the best to move forward with while performing in lab testing. Um, as mentioned by Isabel, we have secured a lab space um, as of uh, January 2022 um, through the uh, BioL499 project um, under the supervision of one of our mentors, Dr. Charles. Um, and the funding received from the Jack Rosen competition will be used to fund our microbial testing, which will significantly influence the design of our prototype. Uh, using the traction we've made as our foundations for next steps, we have planned the following milestones to meet our objective. Um, as of February 2022, we plan to complete our LDPE degrading microbe analysis which will facilitate our team to choose specific microbes for the in-lab testing, which will take place in March of 2022. Uh, the in-lab testing will cover the performance of the microbes and um, understand on how we can incorporate our product into MRF facilities. Um, moreover, uh, we can determine the most efficient LDP degrading microbes. And, and in April of 2022, we will be conducting our environmental analysis to understand the overall impact our product um, is making to the environment. And we will be customizing our solution to be sustainable for the long term. Uh, in May 2022, we will be conducting our customer discovery interviews to ensure we're meeting the needs of our stakeholders. And as of June of 2022, the market research on waste management will allow us to expand our scope of work locally and globally. And lastly, we will be performing our pilot project by the end of this year. Uh, we would like to thank the Jack Rosen family and the members organizing the Jack Rosen competition for providing us with the platform to achieve the traction we've made so far. And we wish all the teams competing today the best of luck. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, a great, uh, a great. Uh, I don't want to say presentation. It's sort of you're sharing with us the journey that you've been on over the last year or so, and uh, it's so exciting to kind of hear about the progress that's been made. I want to say, you know, congratulations on all the amazing competitions that you've gone on to win since Jack Rosen. And there's no question that that each time you do this, you're picking up more knowledge and more information, and the the pitches and the ideas are getting uh, stronger and stronger. And you know, it's unfortunate that some of the timelines have been derailed a little bit because of the pandemic, but it's great to see that you're all still so committed to, uh, to making this work. And, and I think uh, we all continue to think about how exciting an opportunity this is. And, and I know that everybody, judges, faculty, uh, folks that are here, we're, we're all happy to help in, in any way that we can as this project continues to move forward. So that, that is great. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'm getting a note here in the chat that um, the judges are still deliberating. See, I told you this was going to be really tough for them. So let me sort of pose uh, the question here for the audience that um, you've now seen uh, DCOMP's presentation about the things they've done over the past year. Uh, do you have any questions you want to put to DCOMP or are there any sort of uh, reactions or comments that you'd like them to, uh, to, to reflect on or think about a little bit? So let me pause for a moment here just to see if... Um, uh, if, if we get anything in on the chat. I think you may be dodging a bullet, Decomp. Uh, there's, no, there's no specific questions that are coming in here, but uh, uh, again, I just uh, really appreciate the time that you've taken to do this. You are all students and it is a busy time uh, and we appreciate the fact that you've come to share these ideas this evening. Um, so you'll see some of the judges starting to come back now, but uh, we're gonna keep you in suspense a little bit longer. So before I go to the judges, uh, and we start to announce uh, the winners in this process. I do want to take a moment to invite the Rosen family to come and share some thoughts with us about uh, about what they've seen this year and about how this experience uh, continues to be uh, a part of the way in which their family contributes so wonderfully to the University of Waterloo. And I'll invite uh, Shelley Rosen, the daughter of Jack Rosen, to say a few words on behalf of the family. Shelley. Thank you, Brock. Um, on behalf of um, my family, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this event. It's been very exciting and interesting to hear all of the pitches. And I know a lot of hard work went on both uh, in front of and behind the scenes to produce this. Uh, the idea of this competition initially was to encourage 
people that had that were passionate about the environment and had an entrepreneurial ideas and um, to to have a platform and to be able to express them and to develop them. And that's obviously happened and it's been very exciting to see uh, what DCOMP's been doing and also to hear the pitches from the participants this year. And I wish, really wish that we, I know next year, hopefully we will be, that we were uh, able to meet in person because one of the favorite parts of, um, my favorite parts of this event is being able to talk to uh, people after um, the pitches and, and interact with them and ask them a bunch of questions that uh, maybe weren't answered. So uh, I don't know, maybe I should have some email contacts and I can email them. But anyway, uh, once again, very, very exciting. And thank you for um, everything to all of the participants and the people who organized this. Thank you very much, Shelley. And, and as always, it's 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 wonderful to have you as part of the event. Uh, I think it really helps to kind of cement the notion that, that we are somehow part of a bigger family that's doing all these things. And I really appreciate the, the time that you uh, and the rest of your family make available to us each year as, as part of this. And, and I too look forward to doing this in person so we can see each other face to face again uh, next time around. Um, I, I, I have been sent some notes about um, some of the potential uh, solutions, results uh, around this particular event. So um, I, I want to first, uh, I do my best to keep everybody in suspense here. I want to first thank the judges uh, for the work that they've done. This has not been an easy process or an easy set of choices. Uh, and in fact, I see that reflected by the fact that we not only have a winner, but we have um, two uh, honorable mentions uh, running up uh, runner up groups that that are going to go away with prizes as well. So I'm of course going to answer uh, announce these in reverse order. Um, I'm getting I'm getting different notes here in the chat. Uh, so let me sort of suggest that um, uh, I, I will say that uh, we have one one honorable mention. Um, Okay, I see. I see the sorry. I see the dilemma that's appeared in the chat. I'm getting different messages from different people, and they've named the project slightly differently. But we do have uh, one honorable mention and one winner. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that the honorable mention uh, is our team picnic blanket. So congratulations to team Pic picnic blanket is essentially placing as the runners up in this particular event. Yeah, turn your cameras on. We want to give you a a bit of an acknowledgement and a bit of a, a chance to sort of reflect on this. Um, uh, great job this evening. There is a check that is being prepared for $1,000 for your team. Uh, and we hope that that will go a long way to, to, to making this uh, a successful um, uh, sort of venture as you continue to move forward with the ideas that you've discussed this evening. Uh, and I guess that takes me to the notion of who is the finalist and the winner uh, in this whole competition. And we've got the, the sort of the, the drum roll and the slide here. So the winner of the 2022 Jack Rosen Memorial Award for Environmental uh, Innovation is Drop Point Waste Solutions. So congratulations, Justin, for the, uh, the, the pitch that you made this evening. Great job, uh, great outcome for, for the work that you're doing and obviously impress the judges. What I would like to do is just to invite um, uh, Justin, if you want to come to, to your camera and microphone for just a moment, just share a couple of initial thoughts on, on the, what this means and, and where you go from here. Yeah, thank you, Brock. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the judges, um, all the other participants. There is some amazing, uh, amazing initiatives and innovations ventures from other participants. So great opportunity to be a part of this. And of course, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Jack Rosen family. Um, this means a lot to me and I'm super excited to start on this journey. Uh, I look forward to the whole process and making collaborations along the way and progressing this idea. So yeah, I'm honestly sort of lost for words. Uh, so excited to get started on this project and this journey. And I look forward to uh, the next 24 months of pursuing this venture. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Justin. I really appreciate so all the work that's gone into this and all the work that's that's still to come. So it's going to be exciting. And, and I know I speak for everybody who's involved in the background that uh, we are all happy to roll up the sleeves and, and work with you and continue to support you as, as things move forward. That uh, brings us towards the conclusion of the event. And I wanted to wrap up this evening with just a few thank yous, because obviously this is the kind of thing that, that takes a lot of people to, to make it work effectively. Uh, so I, I want to start. I want to thank uh, Angle Media, Julia and her team who have been providing the tech support in the background uh, this evening. Um, it's, it's always great when things run so flawlessly as we switch from videos to live Q&As to different presenters. So thank you very much for, for the work that's been done there. There were a number of people who took on key roles in, in helping to organize the teams and the students in preparing for this event. And I particularly want to acknowledge Tanya Delmato. There was a reference to the Greenhouse uh, program and the, the social entrepreneurship support systems that are available through St. Paul's Greenhouse. Tanya, you've been great through the process and we really appreciate your ongoing support of this initiative. Similarly, there are a couple of uh, people who, who do a stellar job of putting together and running this particular event every year. I just get to kind of read the script and, and, and read things on, on the camera, but the ones doing the real work are Vesti and Miriam. And as always, we're very grateful and very appreciative for the work that you have done to make this event uh, as successful as it is. I, I do want to acknowledge the judges, uh, Paul and Georgina in particular, Brad's had to leave us. So Paul and Georgina, we really appreciate the time that you've taken and the effort that has, that has gone into your deliberations. And although Brad is gone, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that his firm has, has donated an additional $2,000 towards this event this year. So, so thank you to them. Uh, again, thank you to the Rosens. This whole experience would not be possible without the amazing contributions that you make. And the fact that you're here to participate in it every year makes this such a special event. And finally, I, I want to say thank you to the six teams that, that pitched this evening. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, I'm sure there was that anxiety that we talked about earlier. There, there's, there's lots of stress that comes along with this. And that's in the midst of uh, all the other things that you're already doing such an amazing job with. I do want to say, regardless of where you finish this evening, uh, I'm happy to work with you. There are others that are happy to work with you. We, we want to support the initiatives and the ideas that you brought to the table this evening. And whatever we can do to help you take the next step in the journey, we're prepared to do that. Finally, thank you to the audience. Uh, you have friends, family, classmates who have been uh, center stage this evening, and if you've come out to support them, we appreciate that as well, and it's been great to have all of you here. And with that, I will wrap up the formal portion of things. I think that um, for the pitching teams, if you could stay online with uh, after the formal conclusion of the event, that would be great. But otherwise, thank you everybody for all the amazing contributions that you've made for this evening, and we look forward to seeing you at the Jack Rosen Award next year. Thank you very much.